And that's, that's where the Keystone <coughs> pipeline is to release, uh, is to distribute 700,000 barrels a day. Enbridge is pipeline system is to distribute 2.5 million barrels a day. And that goes right through the Chicagoland area. From Alberta, <coughs> through the Alberta Clipper, line three comes to Wisconsin, in Superior, Wisconsin, and then down through Chicago. And just through line 61 to the south side of Chicago, to BP, to line 6B out to Detroit. If you remember in 2010, we had a spill in the, in the Kalamazoo River. That was really quite important because that was the very first major tar sands spill in the United States. It was about a million gallons. Enbridge didn't know about it. Or let's say Enbridge didn't tell anybody that it was tar sands, that it was dill bit, diluted bitumen. And it took about 17 hours before they stopped it. Um, so it has impacted that region enormously. I consider that the clarion call for the movement against tar sands. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyhow, uh, we're going to be talking more about that and there's be a part of a whole network of issues. Along with tar sands, there were fracking issues that you're learning a lot about in Illinois, the policies that are happening in Illinois. Um, so those are other issues that, are, that have come up. Um, one of the things I want to, to bring to the attention, if you remember this past Friday, we had a rally here in Chicago about the, uh, the spill, what I call it a release into Lake Michigan. So, and that's really important because Chicago is seven, in the Chicago metropolitan area, there's seven million people in this area. That is larger than population in the entire state of Indiana. So when you want to realize what's going on down there, why they're doing those things, they're doing it because they're serving the Chicago market. The heavy industry along the southern shores of Lake Michigan serves this market. And that's why I'm really, really happy to see that Chicago has come forward and did and held, held this rally. And I'm very, very proud of it because one of the things that, if you look back through history, um, in the 50s, Indiana wanted to take over the entire lakefront and dedicate it to industry with steel mills. And it took a congressman from Illinois to stop it, Congressman Douglas, to stop that and institute or designate the Indiana Dunes National Park. To this day, Indiana residents still see that as a federal taking of land. They don't see the industry having, you know, having uh, tried to take it for themselves. They see the federal government coming in and taking it from the people. And so those are some of the things that we have to overcome. So Indiana, Chicago is an enormously important part of the consciousness of this region and the ecological part of this region. Um, before I move forward, I want to announce many people here are part of a lot of different projects. Um, Wade, you're with uh, GDR. Well, you, resistance, but where you can I go can... ahead and stand up and introduce yourself. I want to introduce a bunch of people. Uh, my name is Wade Chandler and uh, I work with Deep Green Resistance here in Chicago. Uh, but one of the things I'm working on right now is a fundraiser for the Pinocchio Hills uh, mine, uh, you know, to oppose the P Pinocchio Hills mine that's going in up in northern uh, Wisconsin. This, there's a proposal for the largest pit mine in the world to be up there. It would be something like a mile wide and 22 miles long. So that would be also approximately 8 miles, uh, 20 miles from the uh, Lake Superior. So there, all of this would affect the native community up there the Bad River Tribe, Chippewa Tribe, up in northern Wisconsin because it'll be part of the watershed that gets polluted because of the mining. So, of course, uh, this tribe would like very much to stop this mine going in because it's going to directly affect their treaty rights. You know, in other words, they have all kinds of good reasons to oppose this. But, so it's going to be a long battle because there's a lot of money behind this Tekkenite mine up there. So we're doing a fundraiser. On Earth Day, the 22nd of April, at a gallery here called the uh, uh, Human Thread Gallery is down in Bridgeport Art Center. We'd like everybody to come down if you can. There's going to be basically it's going to be music and some food and some beer and wine and some art on the walls. And so we hope you can come down and have a good time and uh, and help support the Bad River Tribe up there to help to stop this mine. Thank you. You know, Wade came down to East Chicago, I gave him a toxic tour. I tend to give lots of toxic tours of the region. So if you're interested, just contact me, I'll give you a toxic tour of that 
area. Also to recognize, not only has it got the largest tar sands refinery in America right there, but it, that region of the United States is also the, the largest producer of steel in the entire world. It's being, being processed right down there on the southern shores of Lake Michigan. All right, there's also Deborah Michaud here from Tar Sands Free Midwest. If you want to introduce yourself and let them know what you've been up to. Uh, She's well, here in Chicago. We're, we're working on... Uh, Stand up. <laughs> so, yes, I'm with Tar Sands Free Midwest, and we're working on um, stopping or slowing tar sands expansion uh, throughout the Midwest. We are truly at the epicenter here in, in Chicago of tar sands um, pipelines, refineries, uh, all of it. And so we are uh, trying to build some momentum against it, including um, right now targeting the BP plant, which just spilled into our drinking water, as I'm sure all of you know. We have a Facebook page. If you get a chance to be in the Chicagoland area, this will be a good uh, place to get uh, information about what's happening in the Tar Sands Network. Oh, I got flyers too if you want some more information. And also Tom Shepard from Southeast Environmental Task Force is here. He's been dealing with the pet coke issues. You've probably heard a lot about him lately. If you want Thank you, Thomas. Hi, good afternoon. Yeah, uh, just very briefly, we've been uh, approaching it from the pet coke, the petroleum coke that's produced at the refinery in uh, great abundance, uh, about one-third of the tar sands that get pushed through the pipelines and brought here uh, ultimately result in this filthy petroleum coke stuff, and it's uh, dusty, it's blowing all over people's homes on the southeast side, affecting their health and uh, their life, uh, their uh, quality of life there. So uh, we're partnering like with Tar Sands Free Midwest and a number of other uh, environmental groups to attack it on each and every, uh, all the way from the uh, Alberta, Canada, to the pipelines, to the refinery, and to the petroleum coke that's produced there. Thank you. Oh, and uh, the city of Chicago is holding a zoning hearing on Tuesday this coming week. Um, Everybody's invited to come down and, and sign in and um, uh, tell them your opinion. They have a, an ordinance that is going to restrict the pet coke in a certain fashion. We don't think the ordinance goes so far, so our organization and others, uh, Natural Resources Defense Council and others are opposing the ordinance as it's written. We think it needs to be strengthened. This is very close to people's homes and it's, uh, it's a safety issue, it's a health issue and the city needs to do more. And I have some uh, reminders, some flyers that tell you when and where that's going to be held on Tuesday and I'll have them set up back here after that's, the meeting. That's great. And uh, I believe there's one of the sponsors of the group is of uh, this meeting with Guy is uh, climate, our uh, system change, not climate change. Uh, is there a represent here? You want to speak? Yeah, you want to speak and give, you can go ahead and stand up. <coughs> About your group. Yeah. Okay. And what yeah. Your campaigns might be. Um, so yeah, System Change Not Climate Change is a national coalition, um, and it started about a year ago. And um, Chicago's chapter began a couple months ago. Um, so basically, we um, see capitalism as the problem causing the ecological crisis. Sorry, I'm out of breath. I just ran up the stairs. <laughs> um, and so we, we believe that we need to change the entire system radically from um, being based on profit to being based on human need. Um, so we are um, working very closely with the Global Climate Convergence, which is 10 days of action between Earth Day and May Day. Um, so that's coming up, which is a tries to um, show how all, all these different issues are connected from labor to ecology to racism, et cetera. Um, yeah, and then we're trying to get involved with the pet coke struggle, um, as well as other various struggles in Chicago and around the country. So yeah, we, we meet here every other Tuesday at 7 p.m. So if you're interested, you can come talk to me. Our next meeting is April 8th. So, yeah. And I'll pass some flyers around for our next meeting. So, anyways, if you please grab one. Uh, 
great, thanks. And I, I recognize some other faces, I don't remember their names. I can't remember your name with the... Uh, oh, Dave Craft. Dave Craft, yeah. Uh, go ahead, okay. if you want. Any introductions. Uh, I'm director of a group called Nuclear Energy Information Service. We're a 33-year-old safe energy anti-nuclear group. Um, I did bring up some action alerts, which I'll leave at the exit table of Multiculti you can take with you. Um, some events I did not hear mentioned is this Thursday, there's the Springfield Lobby Day, and there's going to be a lot of anti-fracking groups going down there. Uh, so some of the fracking groups can make announcements about that. And the kickoff, uh, April 22nd, and I want to underscore um, to the Earth Day to May Day thing, is going to have an event at the State of Illinois uh, Center at 4.30 in the afternoon till 7.00. So hope organizations can get involved with that. Other than that, uh, we are trying to shut down nuclear plants, and it seems Exelon is obliging very nicely lately. They're claiming they're going to close down five, so it's fine by me. <laughs> so I'll talk to you later. Is there somebody with fracking in Illinois here? <coughs> Dwayne Ediger, you've been doing some work too, right? You want to? Um, I'll just. Say briefly, my name is Dwayne Ediger, and uh, I am a uh, trained presenter in the Climate Reality Project, um, getting into solar energy installation, and I don't represent an organization per se in that work, but thank you, Tom. Is there anybody else that want to want to say anything, introduce what they're doing, work they're doing? Yeah, um, if I get up, excuse me, I try to get up on the capture. Uh, I'm Pam Richard. This is uh, my, my husband, partner, Elaine Richard, and we're uh, with Eco Justice Collaborative. And one of the things I want to call everybody's attention, because I hear a lot about fracking, greatly that I do, and nuclear, et cetera, et cetera, but we, we seem to be, in our sense, we're not, we're not still thinking about coal. We're still working on coal. And many people in uh, this uh, part of the world don't realize that Illinois is really the next Appalachia. And we've got major corporations who have said, it's time to move our, our uh, businesses and corporate uh, uh, resources to Illinois because we have such high value, high reserves of coal. Mm -hmm. So we're working and supporting communities who are bearing the brunt of that cost of coal as uh, entities like Peabody, Energy, Klein Group, Drummond, et cetera, come into Illinois to extract the resource, leave behind all of the pollution, all the devastation, and ship it overseas. So if anybody's interested in, and of course, you know, coal is one of those great contributors to climate change, which is one of the reasons why we're here. So see us. Great. Right. Okay. Um, just one other thing. Uh, I just want to remind everybody, we have a donation uh, pail here. Please donate. Everything goes to Multiculti. Uh, Guy uh, McPherson has been really generous in giving his time. And Tom, or Dave uh, Thomas, who's going to introduce him here, was, is the man that brought uh, Guy to Chicago. Guy is going to be appearing in uh, Hammond on Tuesday evening at 7 at Paul Henry's Gallery. It's at 416 Sibley, uh, Hammond, Indiana. It's a wonderful little place. He'll be speaking there on, on uh, Tuesday, Tuesday evening. Also on Thursday, uh, there is a action a rally in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, I'll be traveling up there with uh, people from the MyCats. Uh, we're, we're, we're have a rally to try to squeeze the spigot up in Minnesota where the Alberta Clipper is looking to expand. So if we can stop a lot of the tar sands from coming into the Midwest, we do a lot to impact a lot of the expansion of the Midwest infrastructure. So we're looking to squeeze it up there and there's going to be line three and line and 67 which is called the Alberta Clipper. So we're going to be in, in, in St. Paul on Thursday. Um, one last thing I want to mention is I come from a frontline community and the Chicago market is really important but as a frontline community one of the things that I find really important is to make sure frontline people speak front the frontline people bring them to your events take the effort to go to them one of the things that happens in frontline industrial communities is that they are marginalized, and there's a reason why they've been marginalized. It's hard for them to overcome that marginalization. So please take that effort to really include those voices. It may be difficult, may be hard. You might be hearing lots of different uh, arguments that don't have anything to do with the issue. But if you endure it, it'll, 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 uh, it'll have great impact. So with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Dave Thompson, who's the man that brought uh, Guy up here. And if you get a chance to hear Dave uh, entertain you, it's amazing. Banjo player. <laughs> um, 
you know, with this darn internet, uh, you can go on there and do this and do that, and all of a sudden you see something, right? You know, I mean, it's right there. You don't have to go to the store and get a DVD or nothing anymore, right? So over the past few years, I've been studying up on a lot of things, watching a lot of college lectures, as a matter of fact, because I'm not an educated man. I'm what you call a ne'er-do-well. Anyway, a few weeks ago, I was doing my usual thing, looking on the internet, and looking at some of my favorite college professors, one of them being Guy McPherson. And I went to his webpage, and I'm looking through it and stuff, and nosing around there, and it says, hey, if you want to, you know, host a tour or whatever, I'll be in your area, maybe. So I thought, ah, ha, ha, ha. Maybe sometime he'll come by and say hello. So I sent him an email. Next thing I know, it sends it back. He said, okay, I'll be there on the 28th. <laughs> and I'm going, looking at my little thing here, you know, you go like this with, you know, have you, have you got one of those, you know? You... <laughs> anyway, uh, so I'm thinking to myself, oh, uh, well, me and my big freaking mouth. All right, so I uh, <laughs> said, sure enough. And Guy, uh, the way he sets this up is fantastic. I urge all of you, to host somebody like Guy, because he's great. All he charges is his airfare, and he's staying at my house. I got a couple of gallons of ice cream. He loves ice cream. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I, I don't want to go on anymore except to say this. Over the past couple days, I've had the time of my life having this man stay at my house, conversing and talking about life in general. We're on the same wavelength, him and me. We're, uh, we, are, we are marginalized types, and uh, marginalized in the sense that we're uh, outside kind of looking in at society. I don't hold a regular job. What I do for a living is any damn thing I want. And um, anyway, I have to say, I'd like to introduce to you right now a man that I've got to, I honestly believe is a genius, the most intelligent person I ever met in my life, a scholar, a gentleman, and a really smart dude. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Guy McPherson. Thank you, Dave. Thanks to Multiculti and to System Change, Not Climate Change, and to Thomas and Dave for putting up with me. And especially thanks to all of you for showing up, because I can't believe it. I start with this slide and you're still here. <laughs> Anybody with any sense would have left. Oh, there I go. I'm one minute in. I've insulted everybody in the audience. My apologies for that. It won't be the last time. It seems, by the way, that we did not choose correctly. Woody Allen wrote th these lines in 1980 in an anthology called Side Effects. And at that point, we had yet, we had already triggered warming of the planet with greenhouse gas emissions produced up to that point that are not, that we have not yet observed. There's a 40 year lag between greenhouse gas emissions and temperature rise. So the, so the temperature rise we're seeing today, 0.85 degrees centigrade above baseline, results from emissions that were produced through 1974. So there's a big lag. I'm not an optimist. I'm not a pessimist. I tend to think of myself as a realist. <laughs> it appears that we're headed for human extinction as a result of climate change and a lot sooner than most people think. We've never had humans on Earth at three and a half C above baseline. Not because we're not clever enough to deal with temperature changes. Right? We've experienced considerably more than three and a half C temperature rise going from outside to inside today. Going from downstairs, and by the time we got up the stairs, we were all 20 degrees hotter because of the steep stairs. So that's not the issue. The issue is one of habitat. We're headed for more than three and a half C above baseline in the near future, and that will cause human extinction, not because we can't adapt to temperature at the level of our bodies, but because we're going to lose habitat for our entire species. Consider, for example, that in the last few decades, phytoplankton in the ocean has declined by 50% or more. That's the base of the marine food web. That's at 0.85 C above baseline. Imagine when it gets to 3 C or 3.5 C, the ocean becomes so acidified that it won't support any phytoplankton at all. That's half the food we eat. Rinse and repeat for land plants, and we're in trouble. 
because we're human animals. What that means is we need habitat, and that habitat must include food. We've had warnings for a long time. George Pershing, Perkins Marsh, the naturalist, and U.S. ambassador, a combination you never hear about anymore, warned us in 1847 about the consequences of burning fossil fuels. In 1847, we weren't burning a lot of fossil fuels. But even at that point, to an informed naturalist and intelligent man, he could predict the urban heat island effect. It stays warm in the cities because of all the concrete and asphalt even at night, so it re-radiates that, that heat during the night. And he also predicted general warming of the planet as a consequence of burning fossil fuels. That's 1847. Don't tell me we haven't been warned. About a half a century later, Svante Arrhenius, who went on to win the Nobel, Pri the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, predicted as a result of burning fossil fuels that the planet would warm about 1C 104 years later. And he missed it by that much. So he was very, very close in his prediction. As a Nordic man, he thought this would be a wonderful thing. One sea temperature rise, let's bring it on. He thought we would be able to grow more food. But in fact, he failed to recognize the self-reinforcing feedback loops that are triggered when we get to this kind of climate warming at the level of the planet. Guy Callender, gotta love the name, February 1938, first demonstrated empirically that the temperature of the planet was rising. Global average temperature of the planet was rising by 1938. And you can see right here in about 1915, we suddenly are almost completely out of the realm of average temperature up to that point. So by 1915, about 40 years or so after we started burning fossil fuels at scale in 1870, 1875, we see a dramatic and sustained temperature increase at the level of, of the planet. So we've known for a long time the prediction, the theory, the explanation why this would occur, and the empirical consequences as of 1938. That's before the nuclear age. Frank Capra, Frank Capra the, the, the filmmaker, when he was working for GE, produced a short film called The Unchained Goddess. This was 1958, so we're in the midst of the Cold War. We're in the midst of the anti-communist rhetoric. It's the McCarthy era. And so nuclear Armageddon was at the door. And the great fear in this nation was that we would, we would spark a nuclear war with the Soviet Union that would cause our extinction. And in fact, Frank Haber points out, we're not only dealing with forces of a far greater variety than even the atomic physicist encounters, that is, beyond nuclear Armageddon, but with life itself, and he's talking about climate change causing human extinction. 1958, a filmmaker gets it. Austrian philosopher Ivan Illich points out in Le Mans in early 1973, and I'm not going to read this whole thing because it's completely incomprehensible. <laughs> Apparently something is lost in the translation between what he was writing and what Le Mans was printing. So I've summarized it with my own, my own version of what he says. I think what he's saying here is industrial civilization is degrading, exhausting, and enslaving and threatens to cause human extinction. And he was right about that. The last below average temperature for any month was February 1985. In the absence of warming of the planet, you would expect every month to have a 50-50 chance of being slightly below average or slightly above average in terms of global average temperature. We've had nearly 30 years since the temperature was below average during any month. 30, when I speak on college campuses, there's nobody in the room except me who has experienced a normal Earth. Every person out there has experienced a warmed planet. That's not normal. February 1985 was a long time ago. Robert Watson, 
of NASA speaking to the Senate Environment Subcommittee on Environmental Pollution in June of 1986 says we can expect significant changes in climate in the next few decades. He actually predicted human extinction in the next few decades. Somebody, one of my Facebook friends posted this on Facebook and Alex Jones was the source. Alex Jones, the, uh, the guy in Austin who's is often viewed as a conspiracy theory kind of guy. And Alex Jones was pointing out that he was wrong. Look, it's been a few decades and we're still here. So all you climate change people are obviously crazy. Well, it was only 27 years. I'm not sure what qualifies as a few decades, but 2.7 decades, I don't think that's a few yet. So I'm not sure we can rule out Robert Watson's prediction of human extinction within a few decades just because it hasn't happened yet. And finally, the United Nations Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases points out in October of 1990 that beyond one degree C, average temperature rise, may elicit rapid, unpredictable, and nonlinear responses that could lead to extensive ecosystem damage. Notice it's not about temperature per se, it's about extensive ecosystem damage. It's about damaging ecosystems to the point that we can no longer grow food to support ourselves and other species on the planet. And the United Nations recognized that more than 20 years ago. So we've had plenty of warnings. I'm going to go through a few of the recent assessments, assessments since the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's vaunted fourth assessment put out late in 2007, when they predicted more than 1.8 C by 2100, up to 4.5 C depending upon the emission scenarios. So more than 1.8 C, up to 4.5 C. Remember, again, the United Nations Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases says beyond one degree C may elicit rapid, unpredictable, nonlinear responses. So this is a serious Rubicon that we absolutely cannot cross, and we've known that for 20-some years. The IPC says IPCC reports more than one C. That's a cause for concern. The cause for concern grows. The Hadley Center for Meteorological Research comes along about a year later and officially says about 2C temperature increase by the end of this century. But the head of their climate change predictions unit said within a matter of weeks afterwards in an interview that probably we're headed for 5 to 7C. There's no way humans survive that. Almost a complete media blackout. Nobody knows about this. You don't see Brian Williams on MSNBC every night talking about the greatest threat to the humanity since the Cuban Missile Crisis. <coughs> that was in the news now and then, back in the 1960s. United Nations Environment Program with more data and more sophisticated modeling comes along a few months later and says 3.5C by 2100. Hadley Center updates their previous projection only a year later and says 4 is the new 2 and it's coming by mid-century. Global Carbon Project and the Copenhagen Diagnosis at the time of the, of the Conference of Parties meeting thrown under the bus by the Obama administration and the, the climate change meetings in Copenhagen in 2009 predict 6 or 7 C respectively by the end of the century. United Nations Environment Program comes along a little more than a, than a, a year and a half after their previous assessment and says up to 5 C by 2050, up to 5 C by the middle of the century by not very many years from now. Suddenly it's not a problem for our grandchildren anymore. <laughs> That's what I heard the whole time I was growing up. Our children, our grandchildren are, are going to have to be concerned about this. It's not our grandchildren, it's us. The U.S. Department of Defense in their quadrennial assessment, their every four year assessment in 2010, finally realizes that climate change is a big deal. Not to human beings, you understand, not to habitat for humans, not even to civilization. What they're primarily concerned about is national defense. Climate change is going to interfere with our ability to defend the country from the terrorists we made, we made up. Damn right. Or whatever. Intergovernmental Plan on Climate Change in their fifth assessment, which is being released in three parts. The first part was released a few months ago. The second part is being released tom tomorrow, Monday and the third part later this year, but the report has already been heavily leaked. Global warming is irreversible without massive geoengineering of the atmosphere's chemistry. So we want to take a look at that in a little bit more detail. 
They don't point out the kind of geoengineering that could be implemented. It's an idea that has only come about within the last few years, and we don't know much about it. The scientific community has not weighed in much on the idea of geoengineering until within the last four months. But you know things are getting desperate when one of the more conservative scientific bodies on the planet, whose results are arrived at by consensus among members of the scientific community, and then are vetted through the political process before they're released. Things are getting pretty dire when they say climate change is irreversible without geoengineering. So let's take a look at some of the geoengineering approaches. In a paper in Earth System Dynamics from December of last year, quote, climate geoengineering cannot simply be used to undo global warming. We don't get a do-over. The horse is already out of the barn. You can't just close the door and expect the horse to be back in there. The evidence builds in the Journal of Geophysical Research that same month geoengineering may succeed in cooling the Earth, but it would also disrupt precipitation patterns around the world. Damned if you do and damned if you don't. So yes, we might be able to cool the planet, but suddenly we won't have any rain where we used to have rain, so we can't grow the stuff we used to grow anyway. So it might work, or it might not. Uh, the evidence continues to build. Environmental research letters January this year attempts to reverse the impacts of global warming by injecting reflective particles, <coughs> sometimes called solar radiation management, or SRM, and, and the most common approach to deal with climate change. Into the stratosphere could make matters worse. We don't know what we're doing. We've never done geoengineering before. When the IPC says, says that's the only thing that can reverse climate change at this point, we're grasping at straws. <coughs> We've never tried this. And it appears, based on the refereed journal literature, that it might not work out as planned. Environmental research letters again, this from about a month ago, there's a risk of abrupt and dangerous warming that is inherent to large-scale large implementation of solar radiation management putting those particles up into the, into the atmosphere. What they find that is that the instant you stop putting the reflective particles into the atmosphere, they, they fall out of the sky, and then you experience a sudden spike in warming. So you have to keep doing it forever. Forever is a long time, especially toward the end. I'm not, I'm not sure we bought in for that. And finally, in paper in Nature Communications, Current schemes, and this, this is a review paper that looks at all of the major <coughs> geoengineering proposals that have been floated so far. They, the paper says, quote, current schemes are likely to either be relatively useless or actually make things worse. So apparently the only way to reverse climate change, and it's an utter catastrophe in the making. In addition, nobody's interested. Americans actually acting wisely, which is something of a stunning development for me, they find that when they evaluate geoengineering, they don't think it's a good idea. Even without knowing the refereed journal literature, most Americans go, now wait a minute, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So it has a stunningly low approval rating. So not only is the science all stacked up against geoengineering as a good approach, but the public opinion is stacked up against geoengineering as a good approach, too. John Davies, writing for the Arctic Methane Emergency Group last September, concludes that the world is probably at the start of a runaway greenhouse event, which will end most human life on Earth before 2040. He's only looking at carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. He's not considering any of the other handful of greenhouse gases that we have emitted. And, in fact, carbon dioxide levels have not exceeded 280 parts per million during the entire human experience, except within the last few generations. And now we're at 400 parts per million. We haven't been at 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for 20 million years, 10 times as long as there have been humans on the planet. So we're really, really playing with fire here by having carbon dioxide levels up there instead of down here where humans came into being. I have good news. 
None of these projections, nothing that I've said so far, are, takes into account collapse of industrial civilization. <laughs> and all the bad news. <laughs> I have bad news, too. <laughs> and by collapse, I mean no food at the grocery stores, no fuel at the filling station, and no water coming out of the municipal taps. So the good, the good news, the good news is that that's coming, because you can't sustain the unsustainable forever, obviously, and this set of living arrangements clearly is un, is unsustainable. It relies on infinite growth on a finite planet with a particularly finite level of fossil fuels. So the good news doesn't include collapse. The bad news is that when collapse comes, it triggers the catastrophic meltdown of 440 some nuclear power plants, and that's going to be inconvenient. And also, none of these assessments, nothing that I've mentioned so far includes self-reinforcing feedback loops, or, or so-called positive feedbacks, that are not really positive at all. So, we've triggered 32 of these. We, we aren't here yet. 32 to nothing so far. <coughs> if we consider some of those positive feedbacks, and Paul Beckwith is at the University of Ottawa, and he works on methane release from the Arctic Ocean. Methane bubbling out of the Arctic Ocean is the first self-reinforcing feedback loop reported in the scientific journal literature. And that's what Paul Beckwith works on. And based on that single feedback loop, he predicts a 6 degrees C temperature increase within a decade after October 2012. That's 6C on top of the 0.85C that the planet has already warmed. <coughs> Beckwith doubles down, well, double and a half, predicting up to a 16 C increase within a decade or two because of methane release from the Arctic Ocean. These are big numbers. These are not numbers to be taken lightly. When the United Nations Environmental Group on, on Greenhouse Gases warned about rapid, unpredictable, and nonlinear responses, this is what we're talking about. <coughs> they feared triggering those beyond 1C we clearly have triggered them when we hit 0.76C, and certainly now at 0.85C, we have triggered many of these self-reinforcing feedback loops. For proceedings, a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science from October 2012, game theory indicates current climate negotiations won't avert catastrophe. Well, of course, of course not. I mean, really, are you going to get a bunch of politicians together who are going to talk about how we can slow down the runaway train? No, they're shoveling coal. And we're voting for them to shovel coal because we want economic growth. We demand economic growth. If anybody threatens to slow down economic growth, we throw them out of office. If anybody actually recommended the steps necessary to deal with climate change, they'd be thrown out of office in a day. Because what does that mean? That means complete collapse. That's the only way to slow climate change. And it's too late for that now. Finally, the academics catch on. Years after it's too late, stop runaway greenhouse. According to a paper in Science, last August, climate change is on track to occur 10 times faster than any time during the last 65 million years. That includes, by the way, an event 55 million years ago in which temperature rise was 5C within 13 years. We're on track to, to be 10 times worse than that. Does that mean 50 degrees in 13 years? That's going to be inconvenient. Does it mean 5 degrees in 1.3 years? I don't know, but either way, we won't see it. Because we won't survive it. According to a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, climate, is climate change is irreversible because the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is so recalcitrant. The carbon dioxide in the atmosphere currently is the minimum level we will observe for at least the next thousand years. We're at about 397 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere on average. And so we'll be at a minimum of 397 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for at least the next thousand years. Contrast that with the message of 350.org selling snake oil, claiming we can get down to 350 parts per million by the middle of the century. We can't, we won't. United Nations Environment Program points out that during 2008, the most catastrophic year of the Great Recession, we don't call them depressions anymore because that's too depressing, so we call them Great Recessions. I don't know about you, but it was awesome for me, the Great Recession. 
During 2008, global carbon emissions increased to their highest level since we fully implemented the Clean Air Act in this country in 1980. It's been all uphill from there. Every year since then, 2009, we set a record, increasing carbon emissions over the previous record setting year. Did it again in 2010, 2011, 2012, and we just found out 2013, we set a new all-time record. Every year, carbon emissions rise between 1.4 and 7 percent over the previous record setting year. It appears that, in fact, Tim Garrett nailed this one with his paper in Climatic Change, published in November 2009, only collapse prevents runaway climate change. And in fact, it's clearly too late. But at the time, there was no referee journal article indicating that we had triggered self-reinforcing feedback loops. None yet. So in November 2009, when Tim Garrett's paper was published, it appeared that complete collapse of industrial civilization would prevent runaway climate change. Of course, it would also trigger catastrophic meltdown of Fukushima times 442 details, but at least it would stop runaway climate change. According to a paper in Astrophysical Journal from about a year ago, Earth is within 1% of inhabitability. That's a really, really narrow slice, so let's see what that looks like. For a sun our size over there on the left, the habitable zone for life on a planet is the green zone. And for the entire history of the field of astrophysics, astrophysicists believe that we're right in the middle of the habitable zone, just like HD4037G here. We were right smack in the middle. But in fact, they find out when they study the issue closely that we're right at the inner edge. The distance from Earth to Mars is about the same as the distance from Earth to Venus. So Venus is right there, and we know what happened to Venus. It went Venus. We're at the inner edge of the habitable zone. If we make a very minor change to our, our atmospheric chemistry, we could, in fact, go Venus, too. And what do you know? We haven't made a minor change to our atmospheric chemistry. When we, when we took over the planet, when, when humans arose, carbon dioxide levels were about 300 parts per million. And now they're about 400 parts per million. That's a big change. When we showed up, methane levels were about 700 parts per billion. Now they're around 2,000 parts per billion. That's just two of a handful of greenhouse gases. We've made major changes in the atmospheric chemistry of the planet. We might well have pushed ourselves out of the habitable zone as a planet. And in fact, it appears we have. According to Think about collapse for a minute, if collapse could save us at some point. Clive Hamilton points out in his latest book, Earth Masters, that without the atmospheric sulfates associated with industry, associated with industrial activity, without those sulfates, which fall out of the air within three days after industrialization stops, Earth would be an extra 1.C warmer. Add 1.1C to the 0.85C we're at right now, and we're at 1.95C. Let's round it up. Let's call it 2. Suddenly, we're at 2 degrees C. That's the political target, right, that we've been trained to avoid? That's what 350.org says. We have to avoid 2C at all costs. Well, guess what? Even if everything collapses today, we're done. We're at 2C. Never mind the 1C target that scientists have known about for 24 years. Let's buy on to the economist target of 2C, and we're there too. Because we keep emitting greenhouse gases, obviously, we're going to get closer and closer to 2, and if we stop, we're going to be at 2 within 3 days. Now there's this contrarian myth that climate change, planetary warming stopped in 1998. Never mind that, that 13 of the 14 warmest years on record have all occurred since the year 2000. Wait, there's only been 13 years since the year 2000. That's right. Those are 13 of the 14 warmest years in history. The other one was 1998. But there's this contrarian myth that based on land records, the temperature has plateaued since 1998, now 16 years, 15 at the time the paper was published in Geophysical Research Letters. Well, we know that heat has still been coming. We just haven't been measuring it because we don't have thermometers in the ocean, as it turns out. All of our thermometers are on land. So when we use land surface records, it, it does indeed appear that the temperature has plateaued. Global average temperature has plateaued. But in fact, there's a whole bunch of that heat going into the ocean. In fact, right, there's 1998. What happens in 1998? There's a sudden acceleration in heating of the ocean, including in the deep ocean. That's a lot of heat. Think of the ocean as a battery. The world's oceans are, are a battery. 
and they're soaking up that heat and storing it there. When does it come up? Maybe later this year. If this is in fact an El Nino year, as many people are predicting, including Noah, then <laughs> that suddenly will bring a bunch of heat out of the ocean and land records will break new records for land surface temperatures. So the heat either stays in the ocean and further acidifies the oceans and therefore contributes to increasing rate of decline of the phytoplankton, or the heat is released out of the ocean and heats up land masses. Pick your poison, it's all poison. Let's take a look at some of the 30 irreversible positive feedbacks. I'm not going to go into these in, in detail. There are 30 of these that are irreversible at temporal spans <coughs> relevant to the human experience. The first of those was reported in the referee journal literature in, in March of 2010 in Science, and that was Arctic Ocean methane hydrates. Hydrates or clathrates are little cages that, that wrap around methane molecule CH4, and as they warm, they rise to the surface, and as they warm more, the clathrate or the cage breaks off, and the methane is re released directly into the atmosphere. This is the clathrate gun, or the methane bomb, that James Hansen worried about in his book, Storms of My Grandchildren. So they reported as coming out of the Arctic Ocean in March 2010. Science is nothing more than elucidation of the obvious. The Arctic methane hydrates are equivalent to 1,000 to 10,000 gigatons of carbon. At the, at the time, as of March 2010, we have burned 226 gigatons of fossil fuel carbon so far. So 1,000 to 10,000 gigatons equivalent of carbon. That's a big number. That's four, four to 40 times what we've burned so far in fossil fuels. A minor increase in temperature is sufficient to trigger methane release from the Arctic Ocean. And as reported in a paper in Global Policy in February of last year, a suite of amplifying feedback mechanisms such as massive methane leaks from the subsea Arctic Ocean have engaged. They're done. We fired the clathrate gun. The evidence continues to build, as reported by the authors of a of a nature that appeared of a, of a paper that appeared in Nature in July 2013. A 50 gigaton burp of methane is highly possible at any time. It's equivalent to more than a thousand gigatons of carbon. So far, we burn well 226 as of March 2010. Over 300 gigatons at this point. That's still three times as much carbon as we put into the atmosphere so far, and it could occur at any time. It's highly likely at any time. When Paul Beckwith reaches his conclusions about 6 to 16 C temperature rise within a decade or two, he's basing that projection on historical record, and it matches with where we're headed in the not too distant future. Finally, NASA's CARVE project last summer reported methane plumes up to 150 kilometers across in the Arctic. So what this looks like if you're in a ship, you're, if you're unfortunate, in the unfortunate position of being a ship in the Arctic Ocean and you're, and you're surrounded by a methane plume, you see a bubbling, a ginger ale style ocean as far as you can see in every direction. And then you're dead because, you know, you can't breathe methane. So it's so large. 150 kilometers across these plumes, so large, so much methane bubbling out of the Arctic Ocean that it is as far as the eye can see in every direction. Sam Carana takes a look at just methane release and predicts a global average temperature more than 4C above baseline by 2030 and more than 10C by 2040. And this is what that looks like. This is a runaway greenhouse effect triggered by methane release from the Arctic Ocean. A polynomial curve fits with the data and projected forward. It appears, according to Malcolm Light's analysis, that the Gulf Stream transport rates started the methane hydrate or clathrate gun firing in the Arctic in 2007 when the energy per year exceeded by 10 million times the amount of energy per year necessary to dissociate subsea Arctic methane hydrate. So it looks like this happened as early as 2007. We fired the clathrate gun seven years ago. Malcolm Light in an earlier paper, now going back two years ago for the Arctic Methane Emergency Group, took a look at the data 
And it appeared that we had fired the clathrate gun and that methane had gone exponential in the Arctic. NOAA and NASA, NASA subsequently revised and smoothed this data set by removing that handful of data points that made it appear that methane had gone exponential. By including those data points, Malcolm Light concluded that methane release will accelerate exponentially, release huge quantities of methane into the atmosphere, and lead to the demise of, wait for it, all life on Earth before the middle of the century. He predicted the loss of all life in the northern hemisphere by 2031, plus or minus 18 years, and in the southern hemisphere by 2047, plus or minus a similar number of years. I doubt it. I doubt we can kill everything on the planet by mid-century. That's clearly the goal of industrial civilization. But I don't think we're that clever. I think we can kill a lot of species. I think we're killing 200 species a day currently. But I don't think we can kill them all by mid-century. Try as we might. I think there's still going to be methane-eating bacteria and methane-eating microbes and some thermophiles, that sort of thing, hanging around for quite a few years yet. But these are the kinds of consequences the United Nations warned about in that 1990 report, rapid, unpredictable, nonlinear changes that could lead to extensive ecosystem damage. According to Albert Bartlett, longtime professor emeritus at Colorado University in Boulder, the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. And in fact, we view things in a linear fashion. Right? We, we project backwards, and we think the temperature is going to increase in a linear fashion like this. So if you're the IPCC, you report that it's going to warm up by 1.8 to 4 degrees C by the end of the century because you're using a linear analytical approach. Climate change has gone well beyond linear at this point. Let's take a look at the consequences of methane hydrates. This is the methane level in the atmosphere as of about a month ago. Dark red means a lot of methane in the atmosphere. This illustrates one of the two reasons why the northern hemisphere is going to lose habitat for humans before the southern hemisphere does. One, there's all that methane that is going to profoundly warm the planet. Methane is more than 100 times more powerful a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide in a span of less than 20 years. It has huge potential for warming the planet. The second reason the Southern Hemisphere is the place to be relative to the Northern Hemisphere is that there's Antarctica down here. The Arctic ice is just about gone, will be gone in a matter of a few years for the first time in human history, for the first time in 3.2 to 5.4 million years. But Antarctica is going to be around for a while. In addition, there's almost no land in the Southern Hemisphere. You've got Australia, a third of Africa, South America, New Zealand, that's it. Most of the land mass on the planet <coughs> is in the northern hemisphere. We have the big ones, right? North America, Europe, Asia. Those are big land masses. Land masses heat up more than twice as fast as the global average. So there will be an, an ameliorating impact of all this marine system in the southern hemisphere as well as that large land mass known as Antarctica. Land and ice mass. So we, we had one self-reinforcing feedback loop reported in 2010, four more reported in 2011. The first of those was Atlantic water shooting through the Fram Strait off the north and east coast of Greenland, directly leading to accelerated melting of the Arctic ice. Instead of reversing course as part of the thermohaline conveyor belt or Gulf Stream, as it had done before. Si there's, there's methane in Siberia, too, and in fact throughout the world's boreal forests. And in the summer of 2010, climate scientists went out and shot some video at the methane vents that were about 30 centimeters in diameter in Siberia. And, and they lit them on fire, like a Roman candle. You can see this stuff on YouTube. Scientists going and lighting stuff on fire, and a big six or eight foot Roman candle goes up because of this methane venting out of the permafrost in these relatively small vents. That's summer 2010. Summer 2011, those methane vents were a kilometer across. A kilometer. Nobody's lighting that on fire. That'll take your eyebrows off. So that's a million-fold increase in the size of these methane vents in one year. It's almost as if we've triggered rapid, unpredictable, and nonlinear responses. Because we have. Drought in the Amazon reported in the 
Referee Journal literature in February 2011. And actually this is a subset of a larger self-reinforcing feedback loop that has been reported since at least 2000 by which drought-induced trees decay more rapidly, decompose more rapidly than they photosynthesize. So photosynthesis is slow, decomposition is accelerated, but it really got the attention of the scientific community when it happened in the Amazon, the lungs of the planet. And subsequently there have been major reviews in a couple of significant journals within the last year or so. And the fourth and final feedback reported in 2007 was peat decomposition. Again, the world's boreal forest peat is decomposing so rapidly that it's essentially sublimating, going from solid to gaseous form in a very short period of time. As it warms and dries in these peat regions, more peat decomposes into carbon kicked directly into the atmosphere, which causes additional warming and drying. So that's a classic self-reinforcing feedback loop. One of those reported in 2010, four reported in 2011, six, I'm not going to go through them all, reported in 2012. Six more reported in 2013, well, six until mid-July, and then six more, and then what the hell, just for good measure, four more, 16 reported in 2013. So we had one reported in 2010, four in 2011, six in 2012, 16 in 2013. Geological events are playing out in real time. We see an acceleration of these self-reinforcing feedback loops, and additional information tacked on to, to support the notion of each of them. And then three more so far in 2014. And these are reputable sources. You know, it's not as if I'm making these up on my blog. I mean, I don't need to. So what we have is, in terms of positive feedbacks or self-reinforcing feedback loops that are irreversible at temporal spans relevant to humans, we have one reported in 2010, four in 2011, six in 2012, 13 in 2013, three so far in 2014, that's 30 altogether so far. And then we have two others that are actually reversible if we have the political will. So we're taking a shortcut through the slushy Arctic because it's so much easier than going the long way around. And now we can. So the question is, now what? The political response remains the same. The political response is to ignore the most, Im the most important threat to humanity in history because it's not as important as the industrial economy. In fact, your president said, the message, if the message is somehow we're going to ignore jobs and growth simply hmm. to address climate change, I won't go for that. We got jobs, man. What do you think matters here? Jobs are habitat for humans, clearly. We'll take door number one. Of course, the Obama administration knew about this briefing reported at COP15 in 2009, now nearly five years ago. The long-term sea level that corresponds to current CO2 concentrations, when it was 385 parts per million, not when it's about 400 like it is today, is about 23 meters above today's levels, and the temperatures will be six degrees or more higher. These estimates are, are based on long-term climate records, not on models. So if we look at the correlation between CO2 levels, temperature rise, and sea level rise, what we see looking through the past, through the lens of paleo-environmental data, is that at 385 parts per million, we would expect sea level to be 23 meters higher than it is today. And temperature should be six degrees or higher relative to the baseline. So yes, given where we're at, it's not surprising that there's no slowing down this ship. Politicians have known for a long time that there's a 40-year lag between cause and effect, between emissions and consequences, between emissions of greenhouse gases and temperature rise. So I don't know about you, but I wasn't even driving 40 years ago. I wanted to. I was looking forward to it, but I certainly didn't know that there would be consequences like the consequences we're seeing today. So one of, the, one of the bits of good news about this is it's not my fault, and it's not your fault either. In 1974, when we triggered the emissions responsible for today's warming, 
the term global warming had been coined only two years earlier. So the individual response, there's societal response remains the same. We want more. We must go faster. That's the whole point of industrial civilization, isn't it? <coughs> to go faster, to get more stuff. At the level of you, at your response, I think that moral philosopher Bruce Springsteen has things pretty well figured out. In the end, what you don't surrender, well, the world just strips away. In other words, let go or be dragged. The near future is not going to be like the recent past. We need to let go of the notion that it will be. The times, they are changing. According to popular culture, Carpe Diem sees the day. Again, when I present on college campuses, students say, no, you're pronouncing that wrong. It's a crappy deal, obviously. <laughs> I'm having a really bad day since you showed up. <laughs> as Nietzsche said, live as though the day were here. To which I would had a line from that philosopher who preceded him by a couple thousand years, Hippocrates. First, do no harm. And maybe, just maybe, the words of Leon Staff, the Jewish poet in the Warsaw Ghetto come to mind. Even more than bread, we now need poetry in a time when it seems that it is not needed at all. Art matters. Science, meaning the elucidation of the obvious, I'm not so sure. And I'm a lifelong scientist. I like to finish with a Hollywood ending, don't we all? That's why we go to the movies, after all. So I'm the Hollywood ending. I have really good news. And after all this really bad news, it better be really good, right? You get to die. And that's amazing, because it means you got to live. And the odds against that happening, the odds against DNA coming together in the, in the physical form of your body, the odds of that happening exceed the odds against plucking a single atom at random from the entire universe. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? We know there's between 10 to the 80th and 10 to 100th atoms in the entire universe. The odds against this collection of DNA, of any collection of DNA appearing in human form at any time in history far exceeds the odds against plucking a single atom from the entire universe. If I believed in miracles, I'd think that each of us were one. It's downright incredible that we're here. We get to be here. And not only that, unlike all those other people who left early, we get to see the end. <laughs> Is that awesome or what? <laughs> we get to see the end. Everybody else checked out. And I, 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 I might go, I'm even. <laughs> in the words of evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins, in the teeth of these stupefying odds, it is you and I that are privileged to be here privileged with eyes to see where we are and brains to wonder why. Wow. We get to be here in human form to see the most amazing world. What do we do? I think Earth is in hospice now. We drive 200 species a day to extinction. We foul the air, we're dear to the water, and it looks like we're taking ourselves into the abyss too. So what do we do? What do we pursue? I think Earth is in hospice. Some people pursue this approach. And so, while the end-of-world scenario will be rife with unimaginable horrors, we believe that the pre-end period would be filled with unprecedented opportunities for profit. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Lloyd Blankfein, right? And, and, and pick your favorite CEO. But we don't have to act like this. And in fact, most of us never have and never will. The sociopaths will always win because we never see it coming. Because we don't think like this. We don't think about the profit to be made from unimaginable horror. That's why the sociopaths always get all the tools, always get all the toys, always grub for all the money. But we don't have to act like this. We, in fact, can act like, I suspect, a lot of us act all the time. We can, instead of pursuing money, we can pursue love. We can pursue lives of excellence. We can surround ourselves with people our love and, and we can act like those people matter, because they do. 
after all, the odds against any one of the being, them being here exceed the odds against plucking a single atom from the entire universe. They're pretty damn special, wouldn't you say? So let, let's act like they matter. Let's be present for them. Let's live here, now, with those people we're with. Let's pursue lives of excellence in the spirit of Socrates. Socrates spent his entire life, all 70 years, asking six questions. Six questions. He just went around asking six questions. What is courage? What is good? What is justice? What is moderation? What is piety? What is virtue? He asked six questions until they killed him. I should be so lucky. <laughs> Are you kidding? He's just asking questions. What an awesome way to go. He pursued a life of excellence by asking questions. Until finally, and, and you know, I ask students sometimes, what was Socrates' most famous line? And I'm thinking they're going to answer, the unexamined, this is how it gets when you turn 50, right? I'm thinking they're going to answer, I have no idea what they're going to answer. <laughs> they're, they're going to answer, the unexamined life is not worth living. And once I ask the question, what is Socrates' most famous line? And I'm thinking some students are going to say, the unexamined life is not worth living. living. And some woman, I can still see her face, Sarah, is sitting in the second row right there on my right. And she says, his most famous line? I drank what? That's <laughs> 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 not what I had in mind. <laughs> in the words of iconoclastic writer from Tucson, Edward Abbey, action is the antidote to despair. I don't discourage people from despairing at this news that we, that we have, as the collective society, mostly our predecessors, made these choices that turn out to be bad choices. And I don't really fault them for that either. I mean, consider oil, this incredibly energy-dense fuel. How could we turn away from it? It was just awesome when, when it showed up. It allowed us to go faster. And it allowed us to, to have so many conveniences. And that's pretty amazing all by itself. And forsaking that is something that few humans would, would do easily. So if you despair, I don't have a problem with that. I despaired for a long time myself. And I think that action is the antidote to despair, even if the action doesn't matter. Even if the action doesn't save you or save our species for a little while longer. The action might save another species for a little while longer. I suspect we're done. I think we're walking around to save on funeral expenses. It ain't cheap to bury a whole species, you know. But I think we can, we can live with the kind of compassion and kindness for which humans should be known and have been known throughout history. That we can act in a way that makes us and even our parents proud of the way we would act. That we can act. And so let's act with compassion towards other human beings and non-human species. Let's act. And if you're damned if you do and damned if you don't, then do. Let's act. Let's terminate those, those processes, those acts, those actions that are sending other species into the, the worst of all possible worlds, extinction. Let's, yes, let's terminate mining of the tar sands. Yes, let's terminate hydrofracturing. Not because it's going to allow our species to persist any longer. We've clearly fired the clathrate gun. Not because it's going to allow us to persist a little longer, but because it might allow some species to persist a little bit longer. And in fact, might make our lives a little bit better and the lives of the people around us. I don't think we can do better than that. If you want to follow my work, and why would you not? such an upbeat, happy kind of guy. <laughs> extensively at NaturePad's last gaming person that I write a monthly essay for Transition Voice, and I write periodically for a website called The Good Men Project. My latest book is called Going Dark. It came out last October. It was avail available from major outlets. And if you don't want to read the book, and I couldn't blame you, if you can just go to this website, to that link at NatureBats last, it'll take you to my frequently updated post on how dire the climate change situation is. I updated it yesterday, I updated it on a very, very regular basis, so I would encourage you to check that out if you haven't had enough despair in your life yet today. Again, <coughs> just being the realist here. Thank you all for coming, I very much appreciate it.
we got a microphone right here. You can come on around here, maybe stand with the line. Just, yeah. the, the, the microphone is not so that we can hear oh, you. Okay. It's so that it can be recorded. Okay. Maybe you could repeat the question. Yeah. Yes, yeah, and I'll try to remember to do okay. that as well. Okay, so they're already geoengineering. It's quite clear that the chemtrails are geoengineering. So do you see any evidence, and they have been for, I think it's somewhere around 10 years. Um, have, do you see any evidence that that might be helping at all? They're well, putting barium and aluminum up there? Well, those are reflective particles, just right. like the sulfates. So Clive Hamilton writes about sulfates. When they drop out, we're going to warm 1.1 C in a matter of days. So terminating industrial activity, including flying airplanes, will cause the the, a rapid rise in temperature at the level of the planet. We've been geoengineering for a long time. We all geoengineered to get here. We got on our car, we turned on the engine immediately. Carbon started pouring into the atmosphere. So yeah, we've been geoengineering for 120 years, 140 years. We just haven't been doing it purposely. Next. I heard you this morning on uh, Mike Novak with uh, Perry Leiterson. It's kind of too bad she didn't come for this afternoon too. As I was listening to you this morning, though, it, uh, I remembered a phrase that a friend of mine used to put on his email signature, uh, speak the truth but ride a fast horse. And uh, so I'm kind of wondering what responses you get and whether you even bother dialoguing with any of the powers that be, like IPCC scientists or government officials. Or what kind of reaction are you getting? And uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, to get a reaction. Question. The question is, what kind of reaction do you get from the likes of IPCC scientists? Um, and, and I think the quote that you began with was, tell the truth but ride a fast horse. Right? Um, so what kind of reaction do I get? Almost none. I'm marginalized, ignored. I'm a pariah. I'm a prophet. And we all know how, how life turns out for, for prophets in their own time, don't we? <laughs> when I left the uni when I left the active service of the University of Arizona five years ago at the age of 49, I was viewed as insane. I was a tenured full professor by the age of 40. I left that life, which I loved, at the age of 49. And a year later, I was talking to a colleague from another state, and she said, "So what have you got?" And she was very curious. And I'm thinking, I got twelve dollars. What did? What do you mean, what have I got? And she said, no, 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 what, what, what rare brain disease do you have? Because, see, <laughs> academics are always looking for the, for the mechanism. It was just assumed, it was common knowledge at this point that I was crazy because you don't leave a tenured faculty position at the age of 49 unless you're insane. So she's asking, what's causing your insanity? What kind of rare brain disease do you have? People don't talk to me. Have I tried reaching out to the powers that be? Yes. I called the governor of Arizona's office and talked at length to her uh, lead staff members for the environment and also energy. This was in the previous administration, Janet DiPolitano's administration. And I, I was explaining the dire situation to these folks, and they just kept saying, there's nothing we can do, there's nothing we can do, there's nothing we can do, which is translated in political speech to there's nothing we will do. Janet Napolitano, we all know now because she went on to head DHS and she's best known for commercials that say, if you see something, say something. Well, I saw something and I said something and that didn't work out well for me at all. So I don't know what she has in mind, but it wasn't what I was doing. The powers that be don't listen to me. I'm crazy. Why would they? <laughs> Do you believe... I'll repeat the question. Yeah. Do you believe that there's any purpose or is it a waste of time to be a political activist for causes? Do you believe it's a waste of time or is it a useful use of time? Does it have any meaning to be a political activist? Is, is that a, for a cause, For causes, yes. Is that an appropriate paraphrase? Okay, so I, I think people should pursue lives of excellence and pursue what they love. If you want to pursue political action, then by all means pr pursue political action. I think that the system we have is irredeemably corrupt and must be replaced for there to be any legitimate change. All right. But if, if you want to, if you have access to people in the high 
the high ranks of, of political office and you think your activism will matter, will make small changes at the margins, knock yourself out. I'm done spending my time on that. I'm trying to terminate the system mm -hmm. so that we have a different system, one that isn't based on the notion that we can have infinite growth on a finite planet, one that isn't based on extraction of materials from the poor channeled to the rich. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what you call that. I think any ism is subject to extreme criticism. But I think the current system, industrial civilization, any civilization, I think is a bad idea. So, but, but I don't discourage people from doing what they think is important work. By all means, if you, if you think you can convince everybody to become vegan and give our species or maybe others on the planet a little bit longer as a consequence of that, please, pursue veganism. But come, don't come to my door. I think militant vegans are probably worse than Jehovah's Witnesses. No, <laughs> But I would rather have 80 Jehovah's Witnesses show up at my house than one militant vegan because they won't say no. They won't say it. They won't go away and they won't say I have argued at length with militant vegans. I, I, I'm not going there. But if you want to be a, a vegan and go door to door and convince people that this is what they should be doing, how they should, if you think that's a life excellent, knock yourself out. Fine. Good for you. Yeah, in the back and then... Uh, so, um, I have a 14-year-old daughter. Um, I share your, um, uh, I share your um, uh, uh, view that uh, probably we can't save all of humanity. Uh, is there a lifeboat solution? You mentioned the southern hemisphere being better than the northern hemisphere. Do you see a lifeboat solution uh, for some part of the human race? Do I see a lifeboat solution for some part of the human race in light of the fact that I have a 14-year-old daughter? First of all, congratulations for having a 14-year-old daughter. Getting to interact with young people is an amazing privilege. And so good for you. Um, I, used to I used to believe that, that a lifeboat would work. And in fact, one of the reasons I left active service at the University of Arizona was to establish a homestead in southwestern New Mexico, which was a lifeboat. And it's a, it, it has failed, in part because if industrial civilization fails, let me rephrase that, when industrial civilization fails, <laughs> as it will, then the temperature, global average temperature rises to 1.95 C in a matter of days. What that means where I live, in the southwestern interior of a large continent in the northern hemisphere, temperature rises at least 5 C in a matter of days. There's no habitat for humans in a matter of weeks after that. So it's a, it's a bad place to move to. I, mistakes have been made. <laughs> I think there will be habitat for humans longest on this planet in the southern reaches of the southern hemisphere. So here I'm thinking New Zealand, uh, Tasmania, southern Tasmania, the, the southern island state of Australia, southern Chile, South Africa, and so on. I think there will be habitat for humans longer in those places than in the northern hemisphere. Or, or just about any place in the interior of a large continent. So a lifeboat for a while, but I don't think we'll have, it, have habitat for humans when, for example, global average temperature rises 10 C. And it looks like because of exponential release of methane, we're headed there in 2040 or so. So I, I don't think in the, in the long run, and, and in this case the long run is pretty short, I don't think we have a have a, have a habitat for humans. But if I had a 14-year-old daughter, would I do things differently? Almost certainly. Yes, right. Okay. Um, are you doing any collaboration or contact or communication with any of the other NCIV crowd, like Derek Jensen and those folks? Am I doing any collaboration with the NCIV folks like Derek Jensen? Derek interviewed me for his radio show about two weeks ago that will be broadcast at Resistance Radio in probably another two or three weeks. Um, on my most recent speaking tour, which was along coastal Oregon and coastal Washington, I was hosted three times, three events, three public presentations by DGR, by Deep Green, Deep Green Resistance. I strongly support Deep Green Resistance and, and Idle No More and any organization that is thinking and acting outside of the mainstream. Um, how that manifests itself so far is by me being 
sponsored by these organizations, hosted by them, having them set up events for me and me throwing them moral support. I don't have any money. I took all of my money out of my retirement funds and put it into the homestead that's a catastrophic failure. So, so that wasn't the swiftest thing I've ever done. I, I refer to it as the greatest mistake of my life so far. <laughs> but I ain't done yet. So, so I try, try to throw my support behind them and they support me on my endeavors, but that's about as far as the collaboration has gone so far. Uh, I was late, and so I don't understand uh, your, your talking about the, colla the collapse of industrial situation, uh, the civilization and immediately having the temperature rise, blah, blah. I just d d didn't get that, but you don't have to explain it if you already did. I might have missed it. No, that's okay. It's a short explanation. Um, why, why does the temperature rise suddenly when industrial <coughs> civilization ends? It's because industrial activity produces sulfates that are kicked up into the atmosphere and suspended there. And when industrial civilization stops, those sulfates fall out of the air within about three days. In fact, in the wake of 9-11, when United States planes were grounded, we saw a profound effect on the temperature three days later. By September 14, 2001, there was a strong, measurable signature in the change in temperature. So when industrial civilization stops at the world, at the world level, temperature is projected to rise by 1.1 C in a matter of days. Because the sulfates aren't up there reflecting right. yeah, I solar that. radiation. Yes. Okay. So it, it, will be, it will be sudden. Yes? yes uh, have you heard of anyone who's worked for our government that was sworn to secrecy about technologies that bring all carbon fuel unnecessary and to the threat of life and level that they were talk about? Have I heard about anybody who worked for the U.S. for the federal government yeah. who was sworn to secrecy because they because they knew about uh, other forms of energy around energy source too cheap to meter. Right, an alternative energy source that doesn't burn carbon. No, I haven't heard about any such thing. And furthermore, I would view energy as too cheap to meter, that was the promise of nuclear power, if you recall, yep. as a really, really terrible idea because it would allow us to maintain industrial civilization further. Industrial civilization is the root of the problem here. Do you want to drive 500 species to extinction every day instead of 200? Bring on the cheap energy. I think it's a horrible idea. Okay. Yeah. All right. Are you aware of a gentleman by the name of Alex Smith from Canada who has Radio Eagle Shop? He's been on this program a couple of times. Yeah, am I aware of Alex Smith who, who broadcasts from Radio Eagle Shop? Um, He's interviewed me once, I believe, and he has interviewed people and asked people about me several times. Yeah, Alex Smith of Radio Ecoshock. Are you? Do you understand? Are you aware of the fact that he took the near-term extinction thesis that you have and tore it to pieces? Am, am I aware that he took the near-term extinction yeah, of, theory that I have and tore it to pieces? The one, especially coming. Right, right, right. So, are you aware of that takedown? <laughs> Am I aware of that takedown based on Malcolm Light's, um, based on my citing Malcolm Light's information? You're part of the Arctic Methane Emergency Group, right? And you and Dr. The next question, you're part of the Arctic Methane Emergency Group along with Dr. Malcolm Light. Correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. Can I answer those questions in order before sorry, we get too far ahead? ahead? Yes. yes. Yes, I'm aware of his takedown, and by the way, I'm, I'm taken down repeatedly. If you want to look further, you can go to Fractal Planet, a blog by Scott Johnson. He does a relatively thorough analysis. Much of that is based on Michael Tobias's work at Planet 3.0. I'm the subject of much criticism, and I'm familiar with essentially all of that criticism. Yes. Would you like me to respond to that criticism in a nutshell? Well, I, yeah, if you could do it in a nutshell. But I was sure. thinking, um, the thing that doesn't make any sense about putting light is the fact that he has an idea about putting, uh, it's 
geo and engineering technique, and I'm trying to figure out if AMAG as a group of people who are dedicated to trying to put together some sort of geo engineering technique up there. And his idea is one of the most incredibly stupid I've ever heard. He's gonna he's talking about uh, a process that puts diamonds in the atmosphere, uh, nano diamonds, and reflecting at the uh, polar caps. And it's just that. I've been following you for a few years, and I remember when this came up, and I didn't understand it. And then when the takedown on the principal was done on EcoShock Radio, I couldn't understand how you got Peter Wadheim, who's one of the most amazing, badass scientists in the world, on your side. You know, and I'm like, but how do you have Malcolm Light on your side? Well, he's a complete kook. <laughs> Uh, wow. <laughs> the thing is, if anybody's interested, and I highly recommend you do, you can listen to uh, this uh, descending point of view on uh, Radio Eco Shop. It's only about 15 or 20 minutes long, but it will inform you tremendously as to who Malcolm Light is and how maybe once you think about it yourself, you might not, because I believe in everything you're saying in terms of we know about the data sheets from the different Tridel Institute and all that, but the near-term extinction thing, and it doesn't seem like you have any actual data review peer set papers. And a couple of times you put people up there that didn't have a, a caveat as to who they are and who they're working for. And, and you know as well as I do, that whenever you talk about this to people who don't know about it, you have to have that, because people will need them. Okay. Day. I've been called crazy many times. It hardly even surprised me anymore. So let's ignore Malcolm Light and Sam Carano. Those are the two individuals you're, you're taking primary issue with because they're part of the Arctic Methane Emergency Group. They propose, they promote the idea of geoengineering. I hope I've demonstrated today that I believe that's ridiculous. I, I've gone through abundant referee journal literature indicating that geoengineering is a bad idea. I don't support that. My work has been, um, has appeared at the Arctic Methane Emergency Group. They have taken some of my work and posted it on their website. That's what happens in the internet. People take your work and they post it lots of different places. So let's forget about Malcolm Light and Sam Carana for right now. Let's take a look at these two pieces of information and put them together. Climate change is on track to occur 10 times faster than any time during the last 65 million years, including a period in the 55 million year period, 55 million years ago, when the climate warmed 5C in 13 years. This isn't Malcolm Light. This isn't Sam Carana. This is science. This is the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. These are two of the three most renowned scientific journals in the world. Are you going to ignore those? No, of course not. Okay, you know, so let's go on. Let's go on. Near-term extinction. If you look at the world, yeah, okay. you can use okay, it. Let me, let, me t let me address that, please. Okay? Near-term human extinction. I think this, this gets us there all by itself, but we can ignore that, too. We know that only collapse prevents runaway climate change, and we had that information quite a long time ago. We know that we're at the inner edge of the habitable zone for a planet, given a sun our size. This is all from the Referee Journal literature. In addition, it was the Referee Journal literature, Global Policy, that finally pointed out in February of last year that methane the methane bomb has been fired. This isn't Malcolm Light. This isn't Sam Crana. This is a referee journal literature by a guy named Jennings at the University of Idaho in the Geography Department. The clathrate gun has been fired. Agreed, but I still don't see the phrase near-term extinction in there. What? Actually, no. see, what I see is the way scientists do it, which is to give you an idea as close as they can without trying to come to any actual certainty because they know that's kind of scary and there's a lot of what ifs. Okay. Yeah. I completely agree with what you're saying because in if, terms of uh, what's facing us, but it looks like the information you were using for the three to five degree that can happen in a decade or less, that um, that we don't know when that's going to happen, how that's going to happen, and then we don't know what time period. And the scientists don't say that that's going to be a direct near-term human extreme extinction. So what I'm actually asking you is that isn't this supposition on your part. You're taking credible information for sure, and you're giving out good information on the, the data papers that we know, but you're putting together 
this possibility of human extinction in a relatively short time, and I still can't find scientists from these organizations that list exactly that phrase. You're absolutely right. I know of no other scientist. No, that's not true. I know of only four other scientists beside myself who indicate that we're headed for human extinction in the near term. I only know of four other scientists. Why is that? Why don't you read that everywhere? Why aren't scientists going on the air like Michael Mann did recently and say by 2036? Because they get money. We're, we're, oh, really? Because of money. For business. No, it's almost as if up in Sinclair was right 100 years ago. It's hard to get a man to understand something when his salary depends upon him not understanding it. That might be part of it. I was part of that system for a long time. Climate science, academia is a very, very conservative entity. Science is a very, very conservative entity. Put academic scientists out there and, and have them try to project from no humans at 3.5C and we're headed for 3.5C in the near future and call that near-term extinction and they don't have a job, period. I was in that system, I was harassed in that system for a really long time. I was asking questions, just like Socrates, and they, they don't kill you anymore for that. But they make your life miserable enough that you'll choose a different path. So why aren't more climate scientists connecting the dots? Good question. I suspect it has to do with money and privilege and luxury and the way they're living their lives. But I can't speak for them. But if you go to my climate chaos link at Nature Bass Last, you'll find that I'm not the only scientist who's talking about extinction in the near term. There's a handful of people doing that now. Thank you for answering. Sure. Yes? Kind of on this point, can you talk about what the Earth looks like at 3.5C above baseline? Yeah, what does the Earth look like at 3.5C above baseline if we get there relatively quickly? And so those, that's a key point. The planet has been at 3.5 C above baseline. In fact, it's been about 6 C above baseline, and there were dinosaurs running around. Right? Last time, the last time it, this planet was 6 C warmer, there were snakes the size of yellow school buses living in the Amazon. And the largest mammal on the planet was the size of a shrew. Because that's the largest mammal that can thermoregulate at the kind of wet bulb temperatures associated with 6 C temperature increase. This is a, this is a rapid change a rapid increase in temperature that we're looking at. And so what that means is that plants will be unable to adapt. Previous temperature increases and decreases at the level of the planet occurred far more slowly, over hundreds of years typically, or thousands of years. Uh, a notable exception is that 5C temperature rise over a 13 year period 55 million years ago. What happens when that happens? Plants can't migrate. Animals can't migrate. They can't keep up. Soils are developed in place, and the vegetation develops in response to those soils. So it's not as if we're going to be able to all move to Canada and suddenly become polite people and say a boot a lot. <laughs> not that that would be necessary. <laughs> and start growing our grains up there. The soils won't support the growing of grains up there, like they support the growing of grains down here. Right? So we can't just move to a colder place because the soils won't move with us. So what does it look like? We don't really know because we've never done this before. We've never done this experiment before, but it's difficult for me to imagine adaptation as a viable solution to the predicament that is climate change. So we don't know exactly what that looks like, but I, I think where I live, in, this, in the southwestern interior of a large continent in, in the northern hemisphere, southwestern New Mexico in other words, I think what happens is the temperature rises sufficiently for a couple of hours one day to denature all the proteins and all the plants. And that's only 120, 125 degrees Fahrenheit. And the all-time record there is 108. So it's not that big a change given where we're headed. And so when that happens, I suspect the proteins denature all the plants and all the plants die and then we have the dust bowl that never ends and I choke to death on dust. Doesn't sound so bad when I put it that way, does it? <laughs> so do all my neighbors. Your mileage may vary. I lived in Tucson, Arizona for a long time. Two of the last five winters were so cold 
that 80 to 100 year old citrus trees dies, died in large numbers. It was so cold because the jet stream is being dragged so much further south than it used to be because the temperature breakdown between the Arctic and the Amazon. So it's not just warm, it's cold too. It's too cold and it's too hot and that's back to back. And so it's this weird combination of events that's going to destroy all the, all the phytoplankton in the ocean, the base of the marine food web and half of our food. And also all the land plants, the other half of the food. So I don't know exactly what it looks like where you are. You're here and then there. Um, at risk of my reputation, um, you have one? Uh, I, no, no, you should join me. After the question. Uh, I do a lot of, uh, too much, Facebooking and looking at articles and this and that. And I understand that uh, super volcanoes are a real phenomenon. And there's one in Yellowstone, I believe it is, that happens every somewhat predictable periodic basis. And we're almost due. But that almost is within Overdue. tens of thousands of years, right. uh, you know, it's a millions of years, I forget what the scale is. Uh, so we've had super is volcanoes. It, is there, is there, uh, does it make sense, given the direness of the climate situation, to hold out a hope that we might get a, some kind of a un, totally unpredictable reprieve some, from such an event? So there are super volcanoes, and the, the Yellowstone caldera is overdue for a massive explosion. So should we hold out hope? <laughs> Did you really use that phrase? Should we hold out hope for nuclear winter? Should we pray for nuclear winter? Yeah, pray, pray. That um, would work. In the, hope that will, in the hope that that will get. And and it's not a bizarre question, really. I get that that's a similar kind of question on a pretty regular basis. I guess that doesn't necessarily mean it's not an idiotic question. It's just that it comes from a lot of people. Sorry. No, it could very well be that we have enough um, volcanic ejecta into the atmosphere to cause sufficient cooling. And this happened after Pinatubo, right? Late 1980s. I think that's right. The climate cooled as a result of a relatively small volcanic event. And so it could be that if we have a big one or a series of big ones over time, that it would at least temporarily cool the planet. But I think that falls under the heading of solar radiation management, SRM, that once the particles fall out, there will be a profound increase in temperature in the wake of that. Could be. So it could be that we have volcanism that leads to planetary cooling in the relatively short term, and that, and that might get some people beyond 2030 or 2040 or, or whatever before we're likely to run out of habitat now, right? Sure, yeah, that could happen. I'm certainly not ruling it out. It, it, it's weird, though, when two things happen. I'm the most optimistic person in the room, and, <laughs> and, and we're, we're praying for a Super Bowl kingdom. Would the Midwest be rendered useless? I mean, from what I understand, the projections are North America suffers, but it would cool the planet. I mean, that's what I heard about the Super Volcano. Yeah, if, if, if Yellowstone Caldera blows, yeah, we can't then, then probably there's no habitat for humans in the northern hemisphere because there's yeah. no light. So there's no plants that grow for a really long time. And maybe even the southern hemisphere, we don't know because we don't know how big that is. Blah, blah, blah. So, but, but, but humans are stunningly adaptable, and we have adapted to ice ages before. So I'm not worried about cold weather. Bring it on. Cold weather, though, without any plants, that's going to be problematic. <laughs> so, you know, we don't know what the future holds. Thank you. Uh, what is the, what is your number for the baseline temperature, and what is a baseline temperature since the temperature has varied over the eons? Right, so global average temperature at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution is about 14 degrees C. Is what your definition of baseline temperature yes. is? Yes, okay. that's baseline. And we haven't seen humans at 3.5 C above baseline any time in the past. And we're now at, at just about 15 C. Yes. Hi, my name is Mark. I'm with System Change, not Climate Change. Thank you for hosting uh, me. We want to thank you for coming. A wonderful talk. Thanks Even now that I'm done? <laughs> Most people only yeah. thank me at the beginning. Well, I wanted to say I think a lot of us in the coalition really resonate with you talking about the need for system change, uh, system efforts, people, and um, 
planet over beneath the prophets. Um, and then my, my question comes out of the quote, I think you used an Abbey quote at the end, about um, action is the uh, antidote for despair. So we're preparing here in Chicago for, and other, other places, uh, 10 days of action uh, for global climate convergence from Earth Day to May Day. And uh, so my question would then be like, is there a, uh, is there a way action could be an antidote for something besides just despair? Like, I don't want despair, but I also want to change the system. Um, so what sort of actions would actually work to change the system we have now? Good That's a great question. From system, system change, not climate change, how do, we, how do we change the system? How do we act in a way that changes the system now? And, and I think that's a great idea, by the way. The, the quote from Edward Abbey is, action is the antidote to despair. And in addition to being an action, action being the antidote to despair, maybe action is an antidote to the system as well, and to system change. There's an article that, that made the rounds in the very mainstream media mm, about two, three weeks ago, indicating which transformers would need to be removed to terminate the electrical grid in the United States. This is the mainstream media. And, and it takes between, what, six and 18 months to make a new transformer. And they're made in China, I believe, in Asia. And they're specific to the site. So each transformer, see, one transformer blows. And it, it could be six to 18 months before a new one can be brought in. And there's only something like 20, 22 or 29 transformers that need to blow to bring down the entire electric grid in the United States, according to this article. I don't even know if that's accurate. But if so, that would be one way to change the system. Right, that's right. Yeah, there was that transformer did. in California. And in 2003, I think it was, in upstate New York, yeah. there, was, there was a huge drain on the electrical grid at peak power, like 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And the grid went out and it spread throughout a very large region and was down for days, weeks, I don't recall. It's been long enough now that I don't remember that sort of thing. So there's all kinds of things we could do to change the system. <laughs> things Bridge large, Street, right? large and small. There's, there's, mm -hmm. a gr there's a wonderful book free online by Keith Farnish called Underminers, underminers.org, that goes through hundreds, maybe even thousands of acts you can take to undermine industrial civilization. <laughs> Jesus that's going to go to, that's, that goes right to system change. You know, and, and people think it's strange and people think I'm being violent by talking about terminating industrial civilization. This is the most violent set of living arrangements in human history. Industrial civilization drives to extinction 200 species a day. Imagine you're walking to, to work every day and you see an, an old woman, she's beating up and killing 200 children every day. What do you do? You, you do something about it? You step in even if the police don't? It's an old lady. What if the system instead, what if it's industrial civilization instead of an old lady? And what if, she, what if it's driving 200 species to extinction every day instead of 200 human babies? I think that matters. It's the most violent set of living arrangements in the history of the world. It requires Oppression abroad, we kill everybody and everything that gets in our way to, to maintain the electrical grid. It requires obedience at home. We have to go along to get along or you get thrown in the clink. Mm -hmm. This is an incredibly violent system and people think I'm, I'm pr promoting violence mm -hmm. by suggesting we take out a transformer. Mm -hmm. I, I don't get the disconnect there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm with um, Rising Tide Chicago and um, there's a meeting after, actually at five today, so in like ten minutes, I'm here. And uh, so we're trying to get a ban on fracking in Chicago, um, and so we're just having a ban fracking general meeting for people in Chicago who are interested if you'd like to come. Um, we have one large pizza coming, but that's not going to be my Jesus or anything, but, um, so I guess, uh, to well, wrap like, things up here? Yeah, to wrap things up. <laughs> okay, Guy, are you ready to wrap things yeah, up? I, I Do you have anything else you want to say? Like, uh, I, I want to take I a question, question from uh, here. And what about here? I'm and a question from here. here. He's had yeah. his hand up for apparently yeah. Paul, forever. Paul, Beck <laughs> you want to talk? Paul Beckworth uh, talks about uh, the high, currently high methane levels uh, over the Arctic and what uh, a sudden release coming from a number of sources is that deep 
in inner core source that seems to be uh, activated, as well as the shallow lactev seas, uh, the clathrates, uh, causing a firestorm. Can you uh, explain what he, how that might manifest itself? Uh, um, no. Okay. <laughs> I can't. I, I'm not an expert. Fortunately, I'm going to have an opportunity to sit down with Paul Beckwith in about a week with, with a filmmaker filming the conversation. It will be live streamed and it will also be archived. So if you pay attention to Nature Bats Last over the course of the next couple of weeks, you'll be able to catch that conversation. If you send me that question in an email message, I will ask him. Because yeah. he's really the expert on that matter, not me. Right yeah, two details. The coronal mass ejection is what could threaten the transformers in the distribution system that will really bring us back to the Stone Age if that happens. Uh, the other thing is that I think we don't touch the, the technical scientific way how the atmosphere, how the Earth gets warm. Uh, you know, the effect of the infrareds and how they, the different gases absorb the infrared and then warm the air and so on and keep the air warm. So you didn't touch any of this, you know, technical. Right. And I think that uh, it, it will be useful for people to uh, get a little bit there, you know, foot wet uh, sure. in that area. Sure, uh, good point. So two points. Um, he, he, the gentleman points out that it's a, a coronal mass ejection, uh, a solar event, could terminate the electrical grid, uh, essentially overnight. And in fact, we're at about the peak in, in a cycle of CME, of coronal mass ejection, uh, throughout history. So we're, we're sort of due for an event, like the Carrington event in the 1700s, I believe it was. Uh, the, the 1848. Sorry? 1848. 1848, thank you. 1848, Carrington event. Uh, and of course at the time we didn't have grid-tied power everywhere and people weren't depending upon a grid to to basically maintain their way of life. Only and the telegraph and lines. Even their life. The right, the telegraph lines. Um, the article that, that I'm referring to talked about the transformers and and specifically mentioned um, acts of disobedience that would remove those transformers, like a sniper rifle. Your second point is I didn't go into the greenhouse effect and, and, and how those greenhouse gases cause temperature to rise. It's called a greenhouse effect uh, because the sh shortwave radiation enters and longwave radiation is trapped in greenhouses. So you know that when you, when you leave your windows rolled up in a car on a sunny day, you go in into your car and it's really warm in there. That's the greenhouse effect. That's what we're do doing at the level of the planet. And I just assume at this point in history that everybody has an understanding of how that works. Mm -hmm. no. But if you don't, no. go to your favorite search engine and type greenhouse effect. And you get all <laughs> kinds of cool pictures. Well, good stuff. <laughs> Final question. Yes. Uh, let me just ask you for your conjecture over the next few years as society begin to start grasping what the hell is really happening, just your own conjecture, how do you think it's going to play out? Do you think people can really cognitively grasp it on a mass scale? How do I think this is going to play out at the level of society over the next few years? Can, can people actually grasp what's going on? I think, I think a lot of people already have a good idea what is happening and what's coming, and they prefer ignorance and so they just look the other way I think that when it becomes so obvious that the planet is, is the planetary average temperature has risen to the point that it's killing people in mass well let me back up it's already killing people in mass five million people a year die early deaths because of climate change they aren't here, so we pretend not to notice. They're mostly in what we call third world countries. I don't know how that plays out. And, and I refuse to conject because I've made predictions in the past. And they've pretty much all been wrong. So, so now I cite the work of others and point out what others think have happened and is coming. And so predictions are hard, especially about the future.
<laughs> as Yogi Berra said. <laughs> so I'm going to try not to go. Aren't you encouraging people to remain human, to try and regain their humanity? Of course. I mean, of that's, course, I'm, I'm yeah. encouraging people to regain yeah. their humanity, to act as, as right. human beings, not as human doings. Right. All right. Don't just do something. Sit there. there. <laughs> Be here now with the ones you're with. All right. With that, I want to thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I just want to remind everybody, thank you all for coming. There's a lot of great talent here. Please take advantage and get to know each other. I saw Laura Chamberlain here uh, dealing with the frack and give her a chance to speak to everybody.